Welcome to Dr. Ron Hammond's office. I'm really glad that you signed up for this Introduction to Sociology Social 101 Hotel course. I want to tell you a little bit about myself and a little bit about the course today. Back in 1993, I took a job here at Utah Valley Community College. I remember very uh, distinctly the promises that they made when I came on. They talked about how we were going to grow, how the population demographics in this community were going to fuel a a large increase in student enrollment that hopefully someday we would become Utah Valley State College. And uh, in 1993 I came with that hope and I worked towards the idea that we'll offer bachelor's degree sometime here. I've also had the privilege of watching it become a university, Utah Valley University, where we have been a university since July 1st of uh, 2008. When I started in 1993 I know there were 47 other people applying for my job. I was so happy to have a professor job. I wanted to teach, I wanted to be in the classroom, I wanted to work with students, and in my assessment I have the best job a man could have in the United States of America because I do what I love. And my role as a sociologist is to play a key part in offering students courses that will uh, educate them on the basics of understanding human behavior. And sociology is about that. And you can use sociology to understand why it is that UVSC has grown so much the way it has. One of the things we wanted to do in this, uh, in this course is to show you our campus and show you our program. So you'll see shots of me on airplanes, at fire stations. You'll see shots of me out on our campus, on the grounds, by the fountains, in the event center. We wanted to show you our campus and let you see what Utah Valley University, which is where we're headed next, is, um, is about. We want you to feel like this is your campus and that you, well, you belong here and you're welcome here. Uh, we are a Utah Valley University as of July 1st, 2008, and our master's degrees are coming off uh, without a hitch, and we're very grateful for the opportunity. What's your role here at Utah Valley University? What's your role as a student, and what can you do? Don't fall into the mistake. I think it's a little bit of a, a logical uh, uh, booby trap to think that every assignment or assessment that you do is proof that you're either college material or you're not. That's not how it works. You get in and you do the work, and as you do, you find that you're good at some things and not at others. But nobody's good at everything. I've never met anybody in all my uh, professional career who's good at everything. So you find the way you learn, the way you succeed in college, and what you're interested in, and you grow with it. You can grow and become part of Utah Valley University, and it can become part of you. We believe that if you come here with an attitude of, I'm going to do my part, I'm going to do my work, I'm also going to have a lot of hope that things will change in my life and that things will grow in my life and uh, that I can earn a bachelor's degree and perhaps even a master's degree and this course is going to help me to do that. It's the same kind of principles that we use uh, in growing this campus from Utah Valley Community College to Utah Valley State College now to Utah Valley University. And if you apply those principles of hard work and hope, I think you'll find yourself graduating and walking through our graduation lines and uh, earning your own degree and moving on with the career and the job that you'd like to have. Now, there is a web component to the course that you'll absolutely love. It's designed to teach you to understand sociology on the internet, sociology in the community, and sociology in the nation. There's um, uh, a research component of it where I've eliminated the use of textbooks for this course and put students back into the original peer-reviewed scientific articles and government uh, publications. And so what I'd like for you to do when you study those is to focus on the things that I'm recommending that you learn. And when you take the test, you'll say, hey, what Ron taught us in class, what I learned on the web, what was on the articles that are online, all of that helped me to understand things that I needed to know for the test. Now here's what you do if you get stuck. You call me, you email me, or you even come by. Uh, I'm in the basement of the Liberal Arts Building. It's the easiest of those three is to email me because uh, I can get, usually get back to a student within uh, one to two working days. And I usually do a good job of that. The interesting thing about it is that you'll find that uh, if you're having any kinds of difficulties with any component of the, this course, it's better to talk to me sooner than later. And we can intervene sooner than later and help you out. Most of my students find that the course works the way it is and that it's functional, that it's been well thought out, and I do have pretty good teaching evaluations for the course. Um, I think if we're going to have any problem, what I anticipate after teaching here since 1993 is if you hit a, a roadblock or a stumbling block and you need a little bit of help. So make sure and contact me early if you have any questions or concerns. 
One of the things you're going to notice in this course is that we have in fact edited the 1995 telecourse where I'm a lot younger and a lot thinner and have more hair and the 2000 telecourse where I'm a little older and a little thicker and have less hair into this 2007 version of the telecourse. We did this for a number of reasons. For one, we wanted to capture some of the valuable things, some documentaries that we shot back in the 90s that were still useful now. And we wanted to keep the continuity of having that good sociology and that uh, teaching modality that we used back then. Another reason is what we wanted you to show, you can see the, the continuity of teaching sociology here on this campus and how it's grown from being one sociologist to having half a dozen plus adjunct faculty and uh, from being an associate's degree to graduate level degrees that we're now offering on campus. So when you see those edits back and forth, you'll know that it's Dr. Ron from three different periods of time over the last decade and a half um, trying his best to help you to understand sociology the way it is and I think you'll get used to seeing the three different age versions of me in this course. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go ahead and start the course and you're going to see the introductions to uh, episode one that follow within about 10 seconds of this point in the lecture and um, it should answer most of the questions that you have about how to take this course and what sociology is and how it fits in your life. Hey, I'd like to welcome you all here. We're just getting ready for the very first lecture of the Introduction to Sociology class. This is a three credit class which is identical to Intro to Sociology courses taught all over the state of Utah and everywhere in the United States where uh, sociology is taught. They teach it pretty much the way we're doing it here. I'm Dr. Ron Hammond. I'll be teaching this course and I'm excited about the class. I love to teach this way. This is my second time uh, going through a televised version of a course. I absolutely enjoy uh, going around um, and meeting people who come up and say, Dr. Ron, you don't know me, but I was in your class. And we sometimes meet in the supermarkets and uh, all over the place where people see me and they'll come up and introduce themselves. And I invite you to do that if you ever see me. I'd love to meet you in person. Now, you know, when I was preparing the materials for this course, I sat back and began to really think about the type of student who would take this course. And I realized that taking a pre-taped lecture course comes with a different set of requirements uh, from students. First thing is, in order to take a course over the television, you have to really enjoy watching TV. Now this course was designed the same way many TV shows are designed. We have producers, directors, audio and camera people, animators, editors, graphic specialists, and a few celebrities who you might um, see during the lecture. Another thing I thought about is that students who take the TV lecture course also have to be self-motivated, self-starters. And that means they don't need to be prodded along by their parents or a teacher who's saying, now don't forget that assignment. The students who take this course will aggressively prepare for each lecture, and then they'll watch each lecture. And what you're going to find as you take this course is it really does pay off in training you how to be a, a good college student. Now the other thing I thought about was that students who take a TV lecture course, uh, that student will also have to be a self-disciplined person and a finisher. That means they will learn the requirements of the course, commit to it, and see the course all the way through lecture 30 and uh, the, the last test that you have to take with those assignments. Now I want to pause here and tell you about uh, a student's interesting experience in college, but before I do I want to introduce you to someone. We have uh, with us today um, Austin Knight. I'll invite Austin to come out here with me. Austin is, how are you doing Austin? Great, thanks. I haven't seen you for so long. Austin is a behavioral science graduate who majored in sociology at Utah Valley State College. And Austin's going to be uh, uh, a teacher's assistant on this course. He's going to be with us all the way through Lecture 30. Did you finally negotiate your contract to go all the way through Lecture 30? Yeah, yeah we got, got it worked out. They're going to pay yeah. me, you know. Big time. So his, his agent was holding out <laughs> for a bigger check. And so what Austin's going to do is he's going to introduce some of the more complex graphics and the visual graphics that will help us to more clearly see the concepts. And why don't we just get a start, Austin? We'll have you uh, go over to your stage. It's different from this one. And we'll have Austin start with the very first graphic as we tell a story about an interesting student. All right. Thanks, Austin. <clears throat> well, what I'd like to show everyone over here, this is where I'll be talking about different graphics and explaining a lot of the data and research that relates to the discussions that we'll be talking about for the sociology class. Um, what you see right now is a, a green background. It's the wall that we use to present the graphics on. 
But when I show the graphics, you actually see bar charts and a lot of other different images um, pasted over this back or this back green wall. And then you'll see me on here as well. And I'll be doing uh, the best job that I can in, in uh, pointing different things out on those graphics. So if we can bring the first graphic up, um, beam me up, Scotty. With this graphic, we're going to call this student A. And we want to look at this student and see their grades in high school and kind of predict um, what most people would, would um, say their chance of success would be in college. This student got eight Fs, 13 Ds, 15 Cs, 20 Bs, and only five As. And down here at the bottom, it says that this student also got nine other A's in PE. So that's really great. But I don't, I don't know if this student would be that successful in college. Um, that's just an example. We'll talk more about this later. But, uh, well, Austin, I, from looking at that high school student's performance, my reaction is get that person a shovel. Uh, don't see them going to college, do you? Oh, gosh. I, I think they, they'd be a lot more better off working on a farm somewhere. Well, yeah, going on a farm, ditch, or something like that. Well, let's uh, talk about some more details about uh, going to college, because a lot of you are thinking, I'm going to college for the first time. I may not be a college student. Maybe that was your uh, GPA and grade report from high school. I don't know. But I want to tell you something. That student, we're calling that student student A, that student took some time off. Uh, and worked at really some menial jobs. I wasn't kidding about the shovel. And did it for a number of years and decided, you know, college really had some hope for me in my life, he said. And let's look at what happened for that student when that student went to college. This student went to university for two quarters uh, after high school. And uh, that student got a first quarter GPA of less than 1.0 and the second quarter was academically dismissed by the university. So all that work with in those various unskilled jobs and, and three years later that student had really socially defined himself as um, not a college student. This isn't, college isn't for me, he said. This, is, this was uh, a problem. Because we're going to talk about later in the course a Thomas theorem. If someone thinks something's real, then it's real in its consequences. And this student thought that he just was not going to make a good college student. So this time he went back to college after a few years off. Tired of working those menial jobs, he gave up his shovel. And he started college the second time with a deep desire to succeed and to get the most out of it. But honestly, did not know how to be a successful student but was willing to learn. By the end of his sophomore year in college, he made the honor roll. This was a significant event for this student. Now remember what I'm trying to say to you is that if you think you're like that student, I want you to hear about his success story. He continued his studies and earned his first scholarship his senior year in college. He told me that the scholarship wasn't even worth that much, but symbolically, as we talk about the symbols people use, that scholarship meant a whole lot to him. So he gained so much confidence by now that he thought, hey, I can try graduate school. So by the time he finished his master's, his cumulative GPA was 3.85 at a major university. And so he now tackled an academic challenge which at first appeared to be a mountain, in his own words, too high to climb. But he found that in those years of hard work, they had all prepared him, undergraduate, freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, master's degree, all of that was good training for a PhD program. Now this is student A. Graduate program grades were as follows. He had 12 A's and 1 B in his 500 level courses. He had 9 A's and 4 B's in his 600 level courses. He had 10 A's and 1 B in his 700 level <coughs> courses. Let's stop for a minute. What do you think happened to the student between his high school and early college flunk out days and his PhD? Well, first off, he became thirsty for learning. He had a sincere desire to succeed grade-wise, but more importantly, he was like a sponge, and knowledge and information became water, and he was thirsty to learn. Hey, colleges and universities are like oceans of pure drinking water. A thirsty student can find all the knowledge he or she wants and never, ever really get satiated. 
And student A, the first time he went to college, he wasn't very thirsty. He had some lofty goals, but he didn't realize that it takes some real preparation, some commitment, and some life changes to become a successful student. He was able to do this the second time around. Another change in student A was that he recognized his lack of skills in learning and was willing to change his lifestyle in order to make room for good habits which would lead to success. And one other, one other point about student A, he was willing to trust the higher education system. He trusted his teachers, he trusted the way they designed the course, he trusted that the new skills he would learn would help him to succeed with the system. Ultimately though, he came to trust himself and gain confidence in his own abilities. Um, do we have any indication? Austin, can you tell us um, the identity of this student that we've been talking about today? It's a privilege to introduce this student and reveal their identity. This student is the one and only Dr. Ron Hammond. <laughs> Whoever came up with that applause gets a pay raise. You get minimum wage plus a dime. Uh, okay, so it's me. I'm student A and I'm proud of it. It's, a lot of people don't like to admit that they failed in college and nearly failed completely out of high school, but I wanted you to know that I did it. And if I can do it, I really think anybody who's watching this course, anybody who's taking college telecourse can do it. When I came back to college the second time as a veteran, I was a veteran of academic failure. I had a purple heart and flunking out of college. As a matter of fact, I may have qualified for the Congressional Medal of Flunking because the first time I didn't really have my heart into it. But let me tell you what I've learned. A thirsty horse will often lead itself to water and find something to drink without being asked, and I became like that. So here's the point of this. Student A, or, or me, I, I designed this course in such a way as to help the thirsty student even if that thirsty student isn't going to med school, even if that thirsty student doesn't have the best academic record. Uh, remember, mine is probably one of the worst academic records of anyone to ever get a PhD. I don't know of anyone who did as poorly as I did. And the point is that if you want it and you're willing to change, you can get there, and this course will help you. I want you to know that uh, I come from this history. I know where many of you are coming from. And if those of you who are feeling left out because you aren't a uh, failing student or you haven't failed in the past, I also know what it's like to get a scholarship. I know what it's like to be on the dean's list now. I know what it's like to be among the academic elite. After my PhD, I was selected for a nationally funded and competitive uh, postdoctoral fellowship at an Ivy League university in Cleveland, Case Western Reserve. I can speak from both sides of the aisle. I've been on the flunk out side and I've been on the academic excellence side. And a lot of what I've learned about succeeding in college comes from the first-hand experience, but I've also studied quite a bit in the study skills field. In fact, I'm uh, designated to teach in a study skills class in the next few uh, months, and I've been training in this for a number of years. Now, even if you're not thirsty to learn, if you will trust me and the structure of this class, you'll not only succeed, but I'm convinced that you'll gain tremendously valuable skills which will help you throughout your college career. I've been through graduate school at the master's and doctoral level. I've done postgraduate training. I've been a freshman, sophomore, junior, and senior two or three times. And I know what it's like. And so I've designed this course not just to teach you sociology, but to teach you college success along the way. Now, a TV lecture course requires uh, you to, and, and this one also helps you to develop these valuable skills that I believe you can get. And like I said, this is my second time through, and I surveyed my students who took this course, and I had about 40% of them respond. And these are some of the things they got out of this course. You become a self-starter. You know that you have to do it, and in this course you know clearly what the requirements are, and you become the one who sets the alarm and answers the alarm, so to speak. You get yourself up, and you get going, and you get it done, and you become self-motivated. We don't have the, the luxury of in-the-classroom interaction together, so as a college student, you have to, uh, you're required to motivate yourself, and that, the end, by the end of this course, you become a better self-motivator. You also become self-disciplined because you realize what's required and you pace yourself to get through it. And you also become a finisher. Now this is important. Someone who goes all the way through lecture 30, takes the last exam, turns in the last assignment. And you also become someone 
who will establish a record of success. And basically, this guides you through every single episode. The reason we do it like this and photocopy it so you don't have to pay a lot of money for it. This will guide you through every lecture. And we'll put that down for right now. And if you watch every class, you'll be able to prepare your study guide from the lectures. You're tested over your own study guide that you write. And we've thought this through well enough that we're going to tell you what you have to learn. You'll dig some up out of the book, you'll get it out of the lectures, and then you'll be tested over your own notes. Now, how will you know when to take a test and what will be covered? Now, let me tell you the way this is designed. These tests can be taken in any order. We have a classroom testing center here on campus. We proctor tests for people who are at distant sites. Students have taken this course from Japan and from the United Kingdom already, and we found a good librarian who could proctor and facilitate the test. But the rule is that you decide when you're ready to take a test. The test is going to cover three lecture, um, six lectures and a number of chapters from the textbook that you use. The schedule is a planner for you for the semester, and you write in the dates that you want to use. Now, not watching the lecture is deadly to your grade because the bulk of the test questions are taken from the lecture notes. You have some readings. You have some research you do in your textbook. But you also have to watch the lectures. I do not believe in tricking students and throwing in these ideas of maybe you can guess what I'm going to possibly remotely consider to be important. I don't do that kind of business. You're talking to a guy or you're listening to a guy here who has uh, suffered enough from higher education and my poor experiences with it. And my feeling is teach a student how to learn, show them what they need to know, and then test them over what you gave them to expect as a standard. Test questions will typically be multiple choice, matching, and some true and false. And it will reflect what you've memorized, such as definitions, concepts, but it also reflects what you've learned. Sometimes I, this isn't just about l rote memory of ideas and proving that you can memorize in your short-term memory or your long-term memory. This is about what did you learn and what does it mean to you sometimes. And even those questions are really pretty clear. Now, those who watch the course use the study guide and do their um, uh, research in their book will find that it's a no-nonsense approach to teaching. I'll try to have very few surprises in the questions. There'll be no questions designed to weed students out. I don't believe in that from a moral and ethical point of view. I'm opposed to that whole idea. This is not an Ivy League state. This is a public higher education state. And for the most part, that's where most people get their college education. And I believe that everyone ought to have equal access and equal opportunity. I have a very strong commitment to the idea that students ought to be told how to prepare for test. They should be told what to know. Then they should be tested according to those expectations. So let's go to a couple of graphics here. How do you prepare for a test in this telecourse introduction to sociology? Well, it's obvious that you need to watch every lecture. Uh, if you don't watch the lectures, you're going to have this, this void in your grade where there should have been points. You also need to use your study guide. It's this, the single uh, key factor. Your study guide walks you through every single lecture, letting you know what's expected. And uh, you should look in advance at that study guide and see what's going to be up for the day. And then you kind of have a general field to look out for. And also do your text research. That textbook has some wonderful information that complements all the many things we talk about. So do your text research, and that's what you, this is how you prepare for tests. Now, what is it you need to know? This is not some great mystery. Here's what you need to know. Your study guide information. Your study guide information tells you exactly what's going to be on the test. And that's primarily what it is. Now, there are some extra credit opportunities. Students want to know, well, what about extra credit? Well, there definitely are some extra credit opportunities. And the first few pages of your uh, study guide, there's a pretest. I want you to take that pretest cold. It doesn't matter if you pass it or fail it. I want you to do your best on it. Take that pretest and mail it to me before you take your first test, your real test number one. Uh, before you go to the testing center or to your facilitator. Get that pretest done and mail it in. At the end of the course, I'm going to ask you to do three extra credit opportunities. One is the post-test. Don't look at it in advance, if you will. Just take it cold. It, again, it doesn't matter if you pass it or fail it. I just want to know how well uh, you learned some ideas in the course. And I'll also ask you to take a survey of the class to give us some feedback on it and also have you do a web page assignment for us. 
uh, that, that is explained, explained in the packet. But all these things are in your uh, Telecore study guide. Yes, so yes, there are extra credit opportunities. The most important thing is uh, get that pretest done early. Get it to me as soon as you can, anywhere between this episode and episode number six before you take the first real test. Now listen, I've been a student. I started out my college career as a flunky. So for a while there, I thought that was going to be my middle name. I was going to do a legal name change, Rhonda Flunky Hammond. Now I know what it's like to struggle in a course where you're not quite sure what to do. And I've designed this course. This is the part where I ask you to trust me on it. I've designed this course to teach you how to study and how to succeed. I also designed the course to reward the student who tries and applies his or herself to the program. There's no attendance grade. No one will be here. That will be reflected in your test because attenders will have a better preparation for the test in the course. And so, okay, how do you use these study, study guides? What is the actual use of the study guide like? The first off, I want you to notice that some of your study, study guide is already filled in for you. This is because we cover a lot of material, a lot of data graphics, a lot of information. If you watch the study guide uh, in advance and if you watch the episodes after you've looked at the study guide, you'll know that we're asking you to fill in the key blanks on each one of these concepts. And so uh, you'll see these graphics like the one that uh, Austin showed us here and a couple of others he's going to show us later. Um, these graphics will have the information you need to put into your blanks and they'll appear on your screen and all of this is included in your study guide for you. These graphics have numbers, percentages, trends, and graphs. But I don't really ask you to memorize so much of the numbers. It's regurgitating statistics isn't necessarily learning in an introduction to sociology class. What I ask you typically to know is the trend, not the number, but the trend. For example, on the graphic from lecture number 21, one of the graphics looks just like this. Austin, you want to talk to us about that? Yeah, Ron, this is what it's going to look like. Um, we've got percentages here, and on this other side, all the major racial groups. And we'll be talking about these in lesson 21 more. But typically, um, our graphics will have percentages, numbers, um, even pie charts, uh, some bar graphs on there as well. and. Um, we'll just describe what the percentages and numbers mean as we go along with the discussions. Great. Thanks for showing that to us. Now, uh, the, the reality is, by the time you get these data, you could write them all down and you can memorize them, but they're probably changing. Many of these data change by the time you get them. So you'll notice that your study guide has certain types of questions. And let's pause before we get to those questions. We have uh, gone to the community for this course and found some really useful types of interviews from some people who have been successful. This one I felt was inspirational. This is Linda Linfield. She's an executive at the Novell Group in Utah County. And uh, she uh, worked her way through as a single mother of four children. And she gave some great insight into going uh, to college and to balancing all those issues. Let's get some advice from Linda Linfield. I know it gets tough along the way. Sometimes during finals week or when a major project is due, you wonder if it's all worth it. Well, I think it's worth it. It's worth it for a couple of reasons, at least a couple of reasons. One reason is that you're sticking through something and actually seeing it through to the end and doing a good job of achieving while you're in school sends a positive message to your children. It says that despite the hard times, despite the difficulties, if you persevere, if you work hard, if you keep pushing, you can attain your goals. And every single one of us as mothers want our children to believe that they can attain their goals. So it's very important for us to attain our goals. And sometimes we, we, feel, we feel stressed out. We feel like we can't possibly do one more thing. And uh, one of the things I always told myself was, you can do anything for the next four months, or you can do anything for the next week, or you can do anything for the next four years. I did a lot of positive self-talk. And then it helps also to have someone in your life, a friend or a member of your family, someone who will say to you when the going gets rough, what else can I do? Um, as I mentioned before, I remarried in this process, and I was fortunate to marry someone who supported me in my desire to go to school and to work full time. 
And sometimes when the going got rough to me and I said, I don't know how I can do all of this. I, I'm, I'm trying my hardest. I'm working my hardest. But sometimes I wonder if it's worth it. He would say to me, what else can I do to help you succeed? And he didn't just say it. He meant it. And so my encouragement to parents or to brothers and sisters or to husbands or boyfriends or girlfriends, when the person you love is trying his or her hardest to go to school, to work, to provide for a family, to um, do all the other, fulfill all the other expectations that we have on our lives. It's so important for us, for each of us, to give support, to ask that person and mean it, what else can I do to help you succeed? So there's one part about being strong in ourselves and believing in ourselves, and the other part about creating a community of learning and supporting each other, helping each other succeed. It's one thing I feel so thankful to my family for, and I attribute um, much of my success, nearly all of my success, to having created a, supported, a supportive family culture that um, enables me to depend on my children as much as they depend on me. I just have to say how appreciative I am of Linda's powerful uh, expression of getting through college. It isn't always easy. It isn't always utopic. But her idea of the, it's, it's not just you, you need to have it in here, but you also need to rally those people in your social groups, those people in your social networks, and get that support and stay with it. And she was speaking to single mothers there for a minute, but she also changed the, the, um, the approach and spoke to everyone. And I want you to know there's a powerful approach here as you look at what she did, working her way through, going into graduate school, and the influence that she had on her children is fantastic. Later, she's going to talk to you about what happened to her children as they supported mom and put mom through college they all became converted to the idea of higher education. It was a beautiful experience. I really appreciate the day, she wouldn't tell you this, but the day that we shot this, she was in the middle of a corporate merger. She broke free from that schedule, did an hour doing these interviews that we used during this course. And that kind of support really shows that even in this class, Linda Linfield is supportive of all the students who are taking this class. She wanted you to know. Let's go back to that last graphic Austin just showed us, the one with all of the um, categories. I just want to show you something. This is what you would typically see. Austin and I will talk to you about this kind of a data. And again, we're not going to ask you to remember all the percentages and the tenths of a percentage point. Let me show you the next graphic. This is typically what you might see on the test after you saw that data. What's the order of the five largest racial categories? Now you're saying, wait a minute, that surprised me. I didn't know I was supposed to know that. Uh, there was so much data on that um, graphic that you showed us, but that's one of the reasons when you watch the show, you have to kind of preview in advance to see what the questions are talking about, because we're not trying to trick you here. We're trying to train you to see and hear and think about the main ideas to become efficient as a student. So you get your study guide, you're going to watch lecture number 14 on rape when we talk about that, and you go through and you look at the questions that it's talking about. What are the things it wants you to focus on? Where are the blanks in the different definitions? Those types of things will be so efficient for you to learn to do. Now don't focus so much on writing down statistics. We built that into the study guide. You'll notice that those statistics are there for you. Listen and think about the statistics and the questions we put into the study guide and think about why is it that Dr. Ron, out of all these statistics that are out there, why is he presenting it to us now in the context of what's being discussed in the course? What's the use for this statistic and how does it help? Now when you see a graphic uh, with a definition on it, write it down quickly and listen carefully to the explanation that comes with the definition. A number of my students said they love to watch this on VCR because they can pause and think about it and they can make notes about things I'm not saying but that they realize. And so I often recommend uh, getting the recordings of this course if, if possible. Now when you see a definitional graphic and you know you're going to have to fill in some blanks, keep in mind that I thought it was important enough for you to know that I arranged the graphic to be produced and for a a place to take those notes in the study guide. This means you'll probably be tested over it. Anything in your study guide is fair game, not numbers and statistics, but anything you have to write down or questions you have to answer from your books or the lecture, that's fair game. So hear and see it, write it, learn it, and understand it. Very important approach. 
Now let's give you another example of a graphic that'll have um, a definition in it that I want you to garnish. And this is the definition of a stigma. I, what'll typically happen is we'll pull it up like this and I'll say, a stigma is an attribute which is deeply discrediting and that reduces the person from a whole and usual person to a tainted or discredited one. Now let me show you what you see in your study guide. When you get your study guide open, you will see a blank. You'll know that you'll want to put that in there. The word would <clears throat> be an attribute which is deeply discrediting and that reduces the person from a <clears throat> whole and usual person to a tainted or discredited one. And those are the key words that you put in there. And then by studying that definition and understanding it, you'll be able to answer the multiple choice matching or true false question that comes up on your test. Now sometimes I'll ask you to know some of the examples for what we've talked about to illustrate that you really understand that. What I'd like to do right now is um, look at where a question that uh, would demonstrate that type of an approach. So we look at the definition of stigma, I give you some examples, and then, then there's a question in your study guide that says, who might be examples of recently stigmatized people? And then what you'll probably see is something to the effect of um, uh, those people's names listed and asking you to recognize what's happened to them, which will probably be stigma. A stigma has been attached. Now let me give you a real live example from a lecture we've already filmed. And then I'm going to invite a special guest to come on board, but let's look at a video clip from one of the lectures on race that we've already done before we did this one. And so let's go to another approach to dealing with prejudice. Let's make sure and find out we know where it comes from. And this is a summary of some of the things we've talked about and some new ideas as well. Where did your prejudice come from? Did it come from your social learning? Were you taught? You have to be taught from year to year. It has to be drummed in your dear little ear. You've got to be carefully taught. You have to be taught before it's too late, before you are six or seven or eight, to hate all the people your relatives hate. You have to be carefully taught. This song, uh, these are words from the song from the South Pacific called Carefully Taught. And this indicates to us that we do learn it. We learn it from our school teachers. When it's in the social structure, we learn it from everyone. We learn it from our homes. Let's go back to this list for just a minute. I wanted to talk about some of the other ideas as well. And I want to show you this cool video of a friend of mine who uh, was able to manage his prejudices in the classroom. Sometimes we have a bad experience in the past. And this experience makes us think of all the people who remind us of that person. And, and it makes us think that they're also involved. I had a student once stand up and say, I'm prejudiced against grandpas, overweight grandpas. And I said to her afterwards, I said, why did you say you're prejudiced against overweight grandpas? And she said, because they sexually molest their granddaughter sometimes. And I realized that she had this experience. And, and over the time, she's been able to deal with that. She's actually become quite a skilled therapist. but. Um, she talked about this and a wonderful example of the horrific nature of human experience sometimes and how that predisposes us to be prejudiced. We've talked about social structure, we've talked about self-justification, and the last one there is this competition or feeling of a threat. Now believe it or not, that was the act, you're going to have to see the lesson number 22 to actually see the remainder of that discussion, that interview with my friend Randy Johnson. But what will happen is that your study guide will probably ask you a question about where do those prejudices come from in terms of race and minority relations. Now in this class to succeed you must use and you must know your study guide. And I suggest you follow these specific steps in actually doing that. Okay, pre-read questions on the study guide. Know in advance uh, what's coming up. Put a star by study guide items which have blanks that require your thought or your writing. So when you see that little mark that you're going to make by each one, you know that's where you have to move to action. Uh, videotape the lectures or check them out or, or just rent the whole set of them. It's not that expensive and you get a refund if you don't let them melt in the back dash of your car. Mm -hmm. And then watch and read. Do your part. Do your part. Do your part. Okay, what we're going to do now as we come back, I've arranged to have some uh, home footage brought in. I'm standing here with Dave Walker, and a, a member of the Wasatch Vintage Volkswagen Club since 2002. How long did it take you to work on your car and get it restored? Uh, it took about two years, and that was working in between a full-time job. So I'd come home in the evenings and uh, piddle around with it, and 
So between time and finances, two years. Approximately how many hundreds of thousands of dollars did it cost to restore? Um, I've got about mm, 10 grand into the bodywork, and the rest is um, engine and transmission and a few other little things. So, so how many of these guys here do you know and have you known for all these years? I'm, I mean, are these, are these becoming your good friends and your buddies? Or? They are. Uh, we obviously have a common interest, and uh, we kind of help each other keep our vehicles on the road and swap parts and whatnot and uh, also uh, trade around techniques. Is everybody here basically the same quality of mechanic or are some of you better than others? <laughs> some of us are better than others. We kind of have a head person who is a mechanic and uh, a lot of us frequent him. We call him Dr. Dave. Dr. Dave. He's the uh, vintage German Motors guy up in Orem. It's true. Yep. So what's special about your car? I mean, if we were to talk about this particular Volkswagen, what makes it different from some of the others? Well, mine's a 1962. It's uh, second to last year of the rag top. First year that they put a gas gauge on the dashboard. That's pretty helpful. Um, what else is unique? Uh, my car in particular is what you'd call a sleeper. It looks all stock, but it has a high performance engine in it. So nobody knows what I've got. Okay, Dave, one last question. This is for all the audience out there. What is your dream Volkswagen? My dream Volkswagen is basically a Herbie car without the Herbie stickers on it. And I'm about one year off, so I think I got it. So you, you drive your dream bug. It's true. Thanks, Dave, for interviewing with us. We're going to talk to the president of this club right now. <laughs> I'm standing here with Al Thomas, an original member and co-founder of the Wasatch Vintage Volkswagen Club. Tell us a little bit about your car before we talk about the club, Al. Uh, well, my car is a 1967 Cabriolet. Uh, I acquired the car uh, from out of state about five years ago and I've been working on it ever since. Uh, you know, I started out doing body work. It wasn't in real bad shape anyway. I had to bang dents out, uh, got it painted up, and then I was able to put in an all new interior, has a, uh, you know, all new engine. Um, you know, I had to go through everything. And now, um, since I've had the car, I've driven to like Phoenix Buggerama uh, three years in a row. I've driven to Buggin 32, which is a big uh, reunion bug event. Um, and it was it was awesome. It had it was like 3,000 Volkswagens there, and uh, and so I take this car on the road. It's not a trailered car. I'm in it. The fun in these cars is driving the cars. Mm -hmm. uh, there's something about going down the down the freeway, just humming along there. It's 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 a it's a sports car feel, uh, you know, and it's awesome. And I, that's that's what I love is driving the cars. So anything I do to my car, I'm going to drive it. If I have to. Like I'm gonna repaint the nose of the car to fix up the rock chips here, probably uh, you know sometime before next season. But the the fun is in driving them. Anybody, the, another unique thing is just about everybody's driven a Volkswagen, yeah. and so you'll run into people. I get more attention with this car than than anybody driving a seventy-five thousand dollar hopped up truck or a, a, another sports car or something, because everybody can relate to the Volkswagen. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Well, if it, let's just say there's someone who's watching the show that might be interested in coming to one of these events that you guys meet once a month. Uh, how how would they find out about it? What would they experience here? Okay, if we meet here at the Rocky Mountain Drive-In uh, on Fifth West in Provo, uh, just to the south of uh, Center Street, uh, we meet at seven o'clock on the second uh, Wednesday of each month. We meet here and then we will cruise to somewhere else to eat. We meet here because they have a big parking lot, basically. If you have more interest and you want to find out more about our club, uh, go to our website, which is wvvw-ut.com. We have a beautiful website there that's well maintained with pictures uh, and information about upcoming events. But uh, you know, if, if, you, if even if you don't have a car yet and you're interested, come on out and join us. We can actually because every. Uh, you know, I've been in this for so many years. I know people with cars, and I and if you're looking for a car, I might be able to help you find a nice one. So, so just come on out and join us. We're all a bunch of crazies. You got to be kind of a sick individual to hang out with this crowd anyway. But we're we're glad to have anybody that's interested. Awesome. We appreciate it. I hope everybody out there, you'll go check out that website. Thanks for your time. I'd like to have uh, Will McKenna come out, and uh, he is our studio engineer. Will, thanks for being on the thanks show. 
Yeah, I appreciate you doing this. Will has made some home footage of um, you, your friends, your family, some of your children are in this, of some of the social activities they do to have fun. What, can you tell us a little bit about this footage we're going to see? Uh, yeah, I, actually I'm not exactly sure what to call it, Ron, because I've never seen anybody yeah. else do it before, but somehow we've successfully combined a, a hill, a bike, and, and a whole lot of water. Yeah. Um, I think the best way is to just watch the footage and we can talk about it after, after we see it. Let's watch this footage of this unnamed sport. I got to tell you, now, do not try this at home on your own and get hurt and then say, I learned that in college. Uh, these are not professionals <laughs> who do this. And as I watched Will, I was thinking to myself as I watched this video, one of the things that sociology does is it really helps us to understand uh, group behavior and, and why we interact in groups and why be, we behave in, in the groups and do the things that we do. Now, I saw some people here. That, can you tell us who were the people who were with you? Um, in this uh, activity, I don't again. I don't know what to call it, but uh, mostly it's uh, friends and a lot of the people you saw were my brothers mm -hmm. uh, and friends. I bring up the, the family as well. You saw my son oh, yeah. asking me to do flips. I'm, I'm not quite to that stage yet, <laughs> but uh, you want to see that. Yeah. But we just get together and um, it's mostly about having a fun time. Yeah, being together as a group and. Um, uh, what are some of the things you think happen as a group that that keep drawing you back? For one thing, it's very stimulating. That's obviously. Right. But what else might be going on there? Well, you know, it is you know, a, a bonding type experience, I guess you would call it. Yeah. Um, you see the group there. Everybody's cheering for each other. Um, sometimes we're being laughed at or laughing with each other, and you can kind of feel each other's pain as you go through some of those hard hits mm -hmm. and. And you can you hear the expressions of concern uh, from some of them, the, the oohs and yeah. the, the things like that. Yeah. Maybe this will become an X game event. You yeah, know? maybe so. And maybe uh, so. You, we'll call it the McKenna flop. I don't know what we're gonna <laughs> what we're gonna call this. We'll work we, on the name. We got to work on the name. But I uh, appreciate you being on here and letting us see group behavior and letting us see uh, why people behave the way they do. And, and thanks for everything you've done to engineer the show. And appreciate you. Thanks, Tommy. Well, take care. It's nice to have that kind of support in uh, this telecourse. And you're going to find there's not just people who uh, are here at the college, but quite a few people uh, all over the community. We even have some interstate interviews that we've done. We've got some footage from around the world. Uh, we had Allen and Bacon, a textbook company, really back us up with some by providing the copyright clearance for some news footage that we use. They provide a number of the graphics that we use. There have been really uh, quite a few people and organizations um, from all over the state and really a, a national picture. Uh, they come from and they, they've donated and contributed to this course so there'll be a higher quality learning experience. And what I'd like to do is have Austin tell you, some of you have been wondering, well, what is that book you keep talking about? Austin, introduce us to the textbook that's required for this course. The book is called Society in Focus. Um, the authors are Thompson and Hickey. Um, so basically that's just a, it's a great intro to sociology book. Um, we didn't put a year because we're sure the way college textbooks go that uh, it will change from year to year, uh, perhaps every two years even. But uh, that book, they've, uh, gonna they're going to maintain the structure of it so it'll work for this course. Now I picked it for two reasons. It's short but it covers a lot of the classical and contemporary issues you need to read in an Intro to Sociology course. And so what Austin said, if you go to an Intro to Social class, you're going to get the basics that you get from the textbook used for that course. That You're going to get those basics in our textbook as well. I do not believe that education is synonymous with suffering because it just hasn't been my case. I don't believe you're supposed to suffer. 
So here's a news flash. I believe that learning is the most important leisure activity in the world. It is and ought to be fun. I have had over the years of teaching a telecourse, I have had people approach me and say, I've watched all your lectures. I have one friend in Springville who's watched them more than once. And I said, you ought to just take it for credit. And he said, I'm retired. What am I going to do with credit? And I know that people love to learn. And they watch this course because I know they watch it because they let me know. Uh, I was at Reams in the supermarket. And I had someone following a, me around in the aisle. And I stopped and I looked at her. And she made eye contact and said, you do. You teach a college course. And she was trying to remember where she had seen me. And then she said something that surprises me. I watch a lot of your lectures. And it's not about me. It's about the whole learning experience. We live in a society that values learning. And television has become a good vehicle for delivering a learning experience to the homes of people in our country. So if you sat through a lecture and you felt that it was too interesting and too thought provoking and too entertaining and that you really did not suffer enough to have truly learned from it, then email me and I'll come up with some grueling busy work, maybe removing bubble gum from the bottom of the desk or something, some kind of way to make you suffer so that you can feel like, now I feel like I'm learning. I have not had that experience in all of my college classes. I have had many college classes that just changed my whole world view, my whole world taken for granted. And I do believe that you can have fun and you can learn. Now let's go forward to another idea I want you to understand. We're running out of time here. I want you to feel like, hey, this is a class I can do. This is a class that I can understand. This is a class that I can predict. No hokey pokey, no weeding out. I want you to be able to understand what's going on. And so uh, let's look at the next graphic I have designed here. I want to talk to you about it in detail. Now that we all understand these, and we, what we have to understand to clarify this is that when you're in a college class, this is one camp that shapes and directly influences textbooks, the training of your faculty members, and the other materials that you use in courses. We have to understand that in the larger social picture in our culture, there are liberal and conservative politics at play. And these politics have really brought us to a point of saying that we don't have the academic freedom that existed 40 or 50 years ago. And many are arguing that now that academic freedom is being suppressed by those wanting to uh, empower their conservative points of view or empower their liberal points of view. And I believe what I'm seeing from a social trend point of view as a sociologist is they're actually getting more intense. And I think you can look to the close race in the presidential election, Gore and Bush, Jr., uh, and see how polarized the nation really is becoming in these matters of liberal versus conservative politics. And the point is those are in and on the college campus. It takes a very sincere effort to eliminate those things from a, a, a course. And one of the things I've tried to do is to approach this course in an objective, kind of middle of the road point of view. So keep that in mind. Let me say we only have a minute left. I want to thank all the people who come on. I may not be able to mention all their names. I want to thank all the organizations, the Army National Guard and Spanish Fork, the Society for Applied Sociology, the American Sociological Association, the Utah County Sheriff's Office, Utah Valley State College, student volunteers, citizens in the community, Worthland Research Group, Mini Lands Food Store, the Knutson Brothers uh, Singing Group, Zane Publishers, Volunteers, Interviewers, Allen and Bacon, Channel 2 in Atlanta, Georgia, ABC News, the Novell Group, a lot more people and organizations contributed to this course. Look at your study guide. Look at your materials. And when you come back, you'll say, hey, I get this. It's just the way Ron explained it, and it's going to work for you. Um, one of the things I love about sociology, and I've been teaching it and learning about it since 1990 when I started my PhD program at Brigham Young University, I love the way it opens the world, your understanding to the world around you. I was amazed by how many things I could understand more clearly and with a little bit of sense of more empowerment because it wasn't such a mystery anymore. A number of my students, and I've had thousands, they'll come up to me and they'll say, I never understood uh, the Cold War. I never understood uh, cultural differences. I never understood my own marriage uh, the way I do now because of the principles that are taught in sociology. And to quote August Comte, he said that uh, sociology would become the queen of all sciences on a chessboard with all the power and the ability to move around the chessboard. And, Sociology is not the answer to everything. I don't think there's a scientific discipline like that out there. But sociology's got a lot of good answers, a lot of understanding that you didn't have before. 
And uh, there are organizations out there such as the uh, uh, Association for Applied and Clinical Sociology, you can find them online, where we focus on using our discipline to help people to understand how they can solve a problem. It's not enough just to study and, and create knowledge for knowledge's sake. We need to do something with it. We need to, in a way, change the world, change our social environment, change our communities using the theory and the research and the science that we have at our disposal. And that's why I've been a member of that um, organization for over a decade now. now. I mentioned that thousands of students have taken my classes. When I first started teaching, uh, I sometimes could notice that my students would have just this awakening expression on their faces where they began to understand wars and conflicts and power and and they also understand things like love and relationships and friendships and marriage and divorce, things that we'll talk about throughout this class. But I really think that what you'll find the most about sociology is that it's very interesting, it applies to your life. And in this class you're going to find that you can use what you learn here in this class to better understand the world that you live in and to better understand your part in it. So if you find yourself at the end of this telecourse saying, man, I'm glad I took that, I'm glad I learned those principles, uh, maybe behavioral science is a major that you would be interested in where you can learn some sociology, some psychology, uh, some social work, and some anthropology. That's, that's our composite degree that we offer at the bachelor's level right now and hopefully some component of that at the master's level anytime now.